the platinum solution. This is, oh, no, no, they have nothing to do with that. It was perfectly aligned on one of Allen's slides. We had the trenches and stuff. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the order in which we go, um, I, I don't have anything strategically organized. I'm just going to go you know, one by one and uh, you all take your turn for the introductions and then for your presentations. It's two o'clock. Should we get started now? Sounds good. Yep. Okay. And we're off. Well, Welcome to the panel discussion for Hot Interconnects 29 from uh, 2022. Uh, my name is Dan Pitt. I'm uh, chair of the uh, panel and keynotes uh, subcommittee and also chair of the steering committee. And we have put together a, a panel of I think really fortunate to get these distinguished uh, technologists to join us today. Um, and the topic is a derivative of the overall theme of the conference of disaggregation and reaggregation. In this case, we're applying it to optical inter interconnects and asking where does disaggregation apply? And where does reaggregation apply? And this whole theme really came out of some observations that some of us had made, seeing how, uh, how the optical interconnects had evolved from being integrated in sort of big monolithic systems to being disaggregated into pluggable components and other sorts of things. And now we're starting to see some re-aggregation someplace as even um, Andrew Lord uh, mentioned uh, about um, sort of on chip and um, integrated that way. And so I thought, let's talk about this um, and see what these companies are doing. And I've chosen these companies because they're all doing really interesting and different things with how we aggregate uh, optical interconnects. And so what I've asked the panelists to do is to take one minute or so to introduce themselves and um, their company and what they do. And we'll go around and do that. And then I've given each of them about seven minutes or so to give a short presentation on their take on this topic and where they stand um, on it, what they think and what position they might have. And at the end of that, we will then have a discussion uh, with your questions in the Slack channel. I've got some questions queued up and I've asked the panelists to not be afraid to ask each other questions. I would like this to be interactive and we're gonna have some apples and some oranges here in this topic, which gives us an idea of the breadth of the relevance of, of this question. So thank you all for joining us uh, among the attendees or a lot. Uh, <clears throat> and so I'm just gonna start by going around and asking uh, for the introductions. And I would suggest those of you watching to uh, choose uh, gallery mode in the view in the upper right-hand corner, choose gallery. Um, and you can see all of us and uh, uh, everyone's got their video on and you can see then how we react to what goes on and people want to raise their hand, interrupt or, or jump in at, at some point, mostly for clarification during the presentations, but then we'll have dialogue afterward. Please feel free to do so. And I will try to monitor the Slack channel for questions when it comes to the Q&A period after the formal presentations. So why don't we start with uh, Michael and Rico. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, good evening, if you're uh, tuning in from Europe. Um, so my name is Michael Enrique. I'm a network solutions architect in Huber and Suna Pilates. So Pilates is a, uh, is a subsidiary of, of the Swiss multinational uh, Huber and Suna. Um, Huber and Suna makes um, all sorts of solutions for connectivity, uh, fiber optics, um, RF, uh, power for uh, industrial applications, and it's, it's quite a large company. Um, Pilates is, uh, is based in Cambridge. Uh, we make um, optical switches, all optical switches, very low loss ones. Um, and uh, my job actually is to work with customers, um, new customers and existing customers to help them integrate um, optical switches into their solutions. And so I do a lot of architectural work um, and I work with customers, especially on, uh, on how to manage our switches and incorporate it into their existing management systems. Very good. Thank you, Michael. Nick. 
So <clears throat> my name's Nick, right? I actually don't work for a company. I work for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I work at uh, NERSC, which is the National Energy Research Supercomputing Center, at which I am the chief architect. So I spend my time leading the technical team that procures and designs and architects the supercomputers we deploy for the Department of Energy, which is what Lawrence Berkeley Lab is a part of. And so we've been looking at disaggregation as a future potential uh, technology to deploy in our center. Very good. Thank you, Nick. Benny. Uh, Benny Corin uh, from NVIDIA. I joined NVIDIA through the Mellanox acquisition, and uh, I'm leading the networking uh, architecture group. Um, spend most of my career in, in Mellanox doing uh, networking products and basically expanding now to NVIDIA. Very good, thank you. David Gomez. Hi, I'm David Gomez. I uh, work for Accelerant. So I've worked, uh, Accelerant is a, a licensing company that does uh, novel microtransfer printing for kind of the reintegration of material. Um, it's a technology out of the University of Illinois from Sarah John Rogers. Uh, I've been doing it for the last 14 years. I'm director of engineering for, for Accelerant uh, located in North Carolina. Thank you, and Cyril. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And thanks for the opportunity to participate uh, in this panel. I have a background uh, in uh, packet switch architecture and network architecture, but for the for the best part of the last seven years, um, I worked for uh, Rockley Photonics, uh, working towards you know leveraging uh, their silicon photonics platform to implement uh, integrated um, photonic uh, ICs for use in um, pluggable transceiver modules, as well as for uh, for co-packaged optics. Um, so I did work both in uh, system architecture for their solutions, as well as um, product management. Thank you, Cyril. And <clears throat> I should point out that while Nick and I are in the Pacific time zone, <clears throat> California, where it's a little after two o'clock, um, David is in North Carolina. He's already at 5 p.m. Michael is in the UK, where it is 10 p.m. Um, Cyril is in the Netherlands, where it's 11 p.m. And David is in Israel, where it's midnight. So I really <laughs> want to thank the panelists for staying up at these hours to participate in this panel. Well, <clears throat> thank you for the introductions. Let's uh, embark on the on the presentations and uh, go ahead, Michael. And why don't you start with yours, please? Okay. All right, can you see that? Yes. Okay, all right, so um, yeah, um, let me just uh, set my little timer going as well here, if you don't mind, just make sure I'm on time. Okay, right, uh, so uh, a few, uh, I mentioned briefly uh, in my introduction there that uh, I'm in Hoover and Sooner, but um, some of the people listening here might not be aware so much about Hoover and Sooner, so a few words on, on us. Um, as you can see, it's a, sort of company, uh, multinational companies headquartered in Switzerland, um, works in, in these three technologies you can see there, radio frequency, fiber optics, and, and low frequency, that, which means power connectors. Um, and, uh, and then three market segments, communications, transportation, and industrial. And uh, the part that I work in, Pilates, sits um, s squarely in this, in this the, lar the largest part of the business, actually, um, which is the fiber optics and communications. Um, so, so Pilates has been developing um, the, their optical switches over the last 20 years or more. Um, we are headquartered, so we are our main uh, location for development is in Cambridge in the UK. We manufacture in Poland, we do some manufacturing in, Ch in China, uh, and we have a sales and support office in, in the US. Um, so it's all about um, optical switches, all optical switches. and. Um, you can see there that um, we have a very low um, insertion loss, but one of the best optical performances uh, around, less than a dB typically. Uh, our highest performing switches can do something like a median loss of about 0.7 dBs on, on a 96 by 96 matrix. We make matrices that go up to much larger sizes, 384 by 384 is the, currently the largest. 
um, and uh, there are plenty of interfaces to control the switch to integrate into various SDN type solutions. Um, uh, how the technology works, we're not based, we're not a MEM solution, we're a beam steering solution actuated uh, by piezoelectric actuators, um, and uh, that's what I'm illustrating here. The, the, the positioning mechanism, by the way, is independent of the amount of light passing through the switch. So in actual fact, um, the switch is a, 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 a true dark fiber switch, which makes it a good switch actually for quantum applications that um, Andrew Lord was talking about earlier today. Um, and here's a little video showing you how the, the um, uh, actuation actually works. What I want to talk about in my, in my brief slot actually is our experiences to date um, in disaggregation uh, and, uh, and I'm going to relate to a project we worked in a few years ago, which is a European, uh, European Union funded project called Dreadbox, which stood for um, dis dis uh, distributed um, recursive, a uh, disaggregated recursive data center in a box. Um, and that you might describe it as an extreme form um, of, uh, of, of disaggregation because it included memory disaggregation. So that's CPU to memory disaggregation. Um, and the principle is that you, you build uh, small uh, resource uh, modules, we called them bricks that had um, processing on them or memory or, or um, acceleration and integrated into those bricks were some, some silicon photonics transceivers um, and then that was all interconnected with a, with a large scalable optical switch matrix which is where, where we came in. Um, so with a, with a solution such as this, latency is the killer. So there were a lot of effort went in this project removing latency um, so, for example, you can see some of the other project partners down the bottom here. Um, UCL, so Professor George Zervis's group at UCL, were instrumental in doing implementing some of the um, some of the IPs on the FPGAs that were in the in the in the bricks, and they were able to do things like reduce the latency through that to something like 134 nanoseconds. Um, and and then a, a lot of effort went into uh, minimizing latency through the optical switch fabric using various schemes uh, that, that I'll go into to, uh, uh, shortly. But essentially, uh, the principle is shown in this diagram here. Another way, um, <clears throat> there are other innovations in the whole project as well, by the way. So there was also um, some partners that brought applications uh, to the project to see how these applications might work on such a system. Uh, there were mo modifications made to, the to Linux kernels to, input, to, uh, to uh, be able to do hot plug, for example and memory ballooning. Uh, so I've, I've already mentioned that the system on chip uh, solution here, the brick, which I'll show you some pictures of in a minute. And the idea was you stack these up in trays and in a flexible manner and then interconnect them with an optical switch fabric. Um, so this was real hardware that was developed. It wasn't just all uh, vaporware and modeling. So here's some pictures uh, of the brick of the, the main tray here that could accommodate 16 of these um, resource modules or bricks. Uh, on the picture down here on the right, you can see the, the silicon photonics module that was incorporated onto those bricks. Um, and this shows you another view of how you might stack this up to make a scalable solution at a sort of data center scale. So there are these, there are these multiple trays stacked up in racks interconnected by a number of um, optical switches that could be built up in, into multi-layer switch fabrics. Um, and uh, okay, the, the optical interconnect is key in all of this. So obviously it needed to be high capacity, low latency, um, reconfigurable. And uh, so in this particular case, we were using at the time, because this was a few years ago now, this project was done. We were using uh, mid-board optics modules, which we acquired from Luxtera at the time. Um, and uh, we were in increased the port density of our, of our small modules that we make to act on the edge of these uh, trays and that's shown in this diagram here so you can see here a three layer optical switch fabric um, and indeed many algorithms were were, were studied um, uh, to, to look at how you would allocate resources across a fabric such as this and uh, again um, our, our partners UCL did a lot of the work in the, in that um, so so one of the things that they did for example was to was to look at latency optimized VM placement strategies um, the idea here was to try and make sure that the latency uh, between CPU and memory was always less than 100 nanoseconds, and that's what they managed to achieve, actually, for, 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 for all of the placements of VMs in a representative setup. Um, 
there were many architectures actually shown here. Um, I won't go into the details because I don't have time right now, but um, I can come back to this later if, if needed. Um, so, so I, I want to sort of finish off by saying, okay, having done this work, what were the conclusions um, that, that we at uh, Huber Sina Pilates drew from this? Well, essentially, um, we concluded that disaggregation per se, especially the extreme form that you see here, was, was, was great for, um, for efficiency gains. So there's the obvious gains because of the lower power consumption due to optical switching. Um, as you can hear, my time is just up. I'll just stop that. Um, I'm just about done here. Um, so uh, we... The, the, because the optical switch matrix there, and obviously there was lower consumption, power consumption there, um, we could um, efficiently um, uh, avoid stranding resources. You could defrag uh, the, the, the arc, you could defrag the um, implementation, and therefore shut down blocks of idle resource, um, and, and the whole the whole solution would, would allow you to scale up and out quite effectively. Um, the, the memory latencies were not quite as bad as you think. Um, However, some of the applications that we tested in this were, 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 were they were able to cope with that, but not all, um, especially for performance related applications. So, so where are we now? What we have seen since this project finished about this project actually finished about three years ago. Um, but now what's happened since then? Well, there's been a sort of slow burn, if you like, um, but it's starting to, to, to take foot. And so now what we are seeing actually at, at Pilates is inc increased interest in sales. Um, in, in optical switches such as those that we make um, for implementing what you might call more conventional data scale uh, disaggregation compute platforms, uh, i.e. without the, the processor memory disaggregation. And this interest is coming from industry leaders um, in GPU implementation and compute implementation. And the kind of things that they're doing here is for provision of, of commodity cloud services uh, and support of HPC applications, uh, including um, where you would use those to put to support machine learning style workloads. So that's a quick summary um, of what we see. Um, thank, thank you, you Michael. I have a question for um, <clears throat> clarification. Is this a circuit switch or a packet switch, and what is the switching time? Okay, right. So yes, it's pretty much a circuit. Optical switching in our case is all circuit switched, um, and our switching time is 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 relatively slow. I mean, it's tens of milliseconds, so of, of the order of twenty five okay. milliseconds. Um, but that's the time you'd need to sort of to to synthesize a physical platform upon which a number of VMs would then be applied. Okay, very good. Thank you, Michael. I'll stop sharing. Okay, um, let's go to Serial. Just one second, let me pull this up here. <laughs> PowerPoint share, here we go. Switch to full screen. Is that coming through? Yes, looks good. Okay, excellent. Um, so I think that in this um, illustrious group of panelists, uh, I'm representing uh, more of the uh, optical component uh, vendor. So you have to kind of you know dig down deep into the weeds and uh, you know go from from the network and application uh, level uh, disaggregation and reaggregation considerations that Michael just talked about to something that is uh, much more at the uh, at the hardware level. Um, so my experience with disaggregation and reaggregation in uh, optical communications has been very tightly uh, related to uh, optical transceivers. Um, so th think of uh, you know, pluggable ethernet uh, optical modules in particular. Um, so at the top left-hand side here, you see one of these, these modules, you know, faceplate pluggable modules that you know, go into your typical rack mounted uh, ethernet uh, switch. Uh, so this diagram at the left-hand side shows you the uh, functional components that you typical, typically find in such a module. 
um, the optical interface is at the top, and then the electrical uh, interface that connects the module to the host IC, which in a typical use case would be a, a switch ASIC, such as a, you know, a Broadcom Tomahawk, uh, for instance. Uh, so inside the module, you know, when you come in from the optical interface, there's some method to actually, you know, attach the fiber to the to the module and to the uh, to the, the, the you know, photonic components that are inside. And then on the receive side, you've got a photo detector, you've got a trans impedance amplifier, uh, you've got a DSP, and then you know you've got the um, required um, circuitry to implement the link towards uh, the host IC. And then on the transmit side. Going from the bottom up, you again have the the chip to module link, the DSP. Then you have a module um, modulator driver. Uh, you have a modulator which is being provided um, by a uh, a laser with the continuous wave um, uh, optical signal to then you know send the modulator signal out uh, towards the, uh, the the receiver. So that that's kind of what you see uh, in terms of components inside a typical uh, pluggable optical module. So what we've we, we've seen is that there has been a you know, strong push to start disaggregating uh, this, and and the main uh, drivers for that have been to you know drive or improve um, three key metrics, which is um, power efficiency in terms of picojoules per bit, uh, cost in terms of dollars per uh, gigabit per capacity, so dollars per uh, gigabit per second, and finally bandwidth density, uh, either in terms of gigabits per second per millimeter, if you're talking about an edge, or, or you know, uh, gigabits per second per per area, or even per uh, per, per volume. Um, you know, with the ever increasing bandwidth demands in uh, data center networks and HPC systems, you know, those three uh, key metrics. Uh, are really critical to making sure that we can keep scaling the network capacity and the optical link capacity in particular uh, to keep pace with the demand for compute capacity. Um, so what the proposal has been is to disaggregate these transceivers uh, into an optical engine, which is uh, shown here. Um, the laser source, which is uh, preferably uh, external, and then kind of all the uh, auxiliary parts like a, the microcontroller and, and DC uh, DC uh, conversion. Then there are two schools of thought on what should happen with the DSP. One school says that it should go into the uh, optical engine, like shown uh, here, um, but then by improving the packaging, bringing the optical engine much closer to the host IC than they are with pluggable uh, transceivers, you know you can greatly simplify uh, this this uh, you know host IC to optical engine uh, interface and you know, save uh, substantially save power that way. Uh, the second school of of thought and. and that approach is being proposed by the CPO uh, G JDF that has been um, started by Microsoft and, and Facebook. So this, this uh, diagram on the bottom right-hand side illustrates that particular architecture. Uh, another school of thought says that actually we should try to do away with that interface between the switch and the optical engine altogether, basically in integrate the DSP, which is anyway uh, going to have to be implemented in an advanced CMOS node along with the switch itself, and then have an, um, an analog slash direct drive uh, interface between the host IC and the optical engine. And that should uh, on paper give you the um, most substantial uh, power savings, which is uh, I think the key metric that most of the hyperscale data center operators are aiming to improve. So that that's the disaggregation part at the transceiver level. Uh, then, in terms of the the reaggregation, doesn't take uh, too much creat creativity or imagination um, to uh, to come up with that one. So basically, what you do is you take these different uh, functional blocks that you disaggregated from multiple transceivers and you know, essentially integrate them. So you get this. I have to see if I can remove this. No, I can't. Um, so basically, you you combine the optical engines from a whole bunch of transceivers into a single um, into a single pick. Um, you put all those DSPs into the same host IC. 
you uh, consolidate all the lasers for all of those channels uh, into a single external laser module, and then you also consolidate all of the uh, of the control logic uh, into a single uh, module. So th that's that's the first part of the of the reaggregation, uh, and then the second part of of reaggregation is that you bring those optics inside the box. So where they used to be on the on the front. A panel now you bring them inside the box as close as possible to the main switch ASIC uh, to shorten that electrical channel that allows you to um, to save uh, to save power uh, that's basically shown at the bottom uh, right hand side here so overall you know this would allow us to increase the channel count from currently four to eight channels per pluggable module to something like 32 to 64 four channels per optical engine uh, correspondingly, uh, you know, driving down uh, the the cost per gigabit, um, increasing the bandwidth density, and reducing uh, the overall power draw. Uh, in terms of, uh, of of trade offs, there are three broad categories here on the technical front, in terms of the deployment model, and in terms of the optics e ecosystem and, uh, and and business model. Uh, on the technical front, there's big discussion on whether the laser should go outside or inside. Um, you know, should the DSP go on the engine or in the host uh, IC? What is that interface between the engine and, and the host IC? And then, of course, you know, what is your choice of photonic uh, integration platform? How do you do the packaging? And I also like to uh, specifically highlight the modulator technology here as a key choice because the modulators typically have a fairly high insertion loss. So there's quite a lot to, to gain there, which would not only benefit uh, CPO, but would also benefit uh, pluggable optics. Uh, the deployment model, this is a, this is a, a biggie. Um, you know, basically by taking this path, you're making the end users give up the uh, advantages of uh, pluggables, such as interoperability, having a multi-vendor um, uh, ecosystem, having a lot of flexibility, uh, field serviceability, a pay-as-you-go model, and uh, th that has been a pretty tall order to um, you know get people to to give up on those benefits to um, uh, adopt uh, co-packaging. On the optics ecosystem, so I'm, I'm going, not going to go in, into a lot of detail here, but you know. Basically, the question is, um, you know, who is going to sell what to whom? Is it going to lead to increasing vertical integration? So there's only going to be, uh, you know, a few very big companies that do everything uh, in-house. Uh, is that going to be palatable uh, to the end users, basically having to buy not only the switches, but all the optics from, from the same vendor? Um, how can you still ensure a multi-vendor ecosystem? Um, so, you know, you're going to have to think about a new set of standards and MSA uh, in this space to uh, to enable that. And, then, you know, finally, what happened to the traditional module vendors that integrate components uh, from, from the optical component vendors and sold them on? To the uh, uh, the network uh, the network builders are they, are they going to get squeezed out uh, entirely? Um, this one I'm gonna I'm gonna skip and then I just want to talk a little bit about uh, about hurdles um, that are being faced in the adoption of co-packaging. So basically, pluggables are not going to go away anytime soon. There's currently still. Uh, a notable lack of industry alignment uh, that keeps delaying uh, CPO's widespread, uh, widespread adoption. And in fact, uh, because of the delays, is currently fueling efforts on doubling down to improve uh, pluggables. Um, so the CPO targets need to be sufficiently aggressive to justify its adoption. I think that um, currently that is that is not so much the case. Um, and of course, there needs to be alignment on what the architecture is, what the interfaces are, and what the form factors are um, to, to get a multi-vendor uh, ecosystem. It also seems that the initial thought that with data center Ethernet optics being you know, dominant in terms of the overall pluggable optics market, that would be uh, the initial driver for CPO adoption, but it's not looking that way right now. It, it looks like um, you know, more targeted use cases in tightly coupled compute systems for high performance computing and AI may actually benefit uh, more uh, initially. And uh, it, it does seem that adoption of co-packaging in those kinds of systems uh, is uh, likely to come before uh, broad adoption in the um, hyperscale data center uh, community. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, in terms of the, the photonic integration platforms themselves, they do still lack the maturity and the volume. Um, I also believe that the market for data center optics is insufficient um, to drive these true economies of scale that have been touted as um, the key benefits of certain photonic integration uh, platforms. In addition to that, the Foundry ecosystem is still quite uh, quite fragmented. Um, so, you know, one strategy that uh, Rockley Photonics in particular had been uh, pursuing is to leverage photonic integration across multiple market verticals to drive such volumes that would benefit um, not only optical communications, but also other use cases of, uh, of photonics. And then finally, we really need to strive towards a CMOS-like foundry ecosystem you know, with all the bells and whistles that come with that, like the you know, PDKs, mature design simulation and verification tools uh, to lower the threshold of adoption, uh, drive volume and economies of scale. I mean, one, one final thought is that you know, once we have these cost-effective, low-power and high-density optical links, uh, this can enable a fundamental re-architecture of data center and HPC networks. Um, so that's just, you know, just to try and make that bridge uh, towards the, uh, uh, the the higher levels that are usually thought of at uh, at hot interconnects. Um, and this is something that we also did some. Uh, some research on on how you know when you have these kinds of links how can you start thinking about changing uh, your topology and not be driven as much by uh, the considerations of the relative costs of the uh, of the links at all the different tiers uh, of your system and with that uh, i'd like to stop thanks thank you thank you serial it's fascinating and you know you mentioned there might be some customer resistance to sort of integrating the uh, in optics with the switches well that's sort of where we started <laughs> and they didn't like that so that got broken up and now it looks like it might be an attractive technical option um and we'll see how customers will react to that so thank you um and now for something completely different david gomez so uh, you know i'll i'll uh I'll, I'll share with you guys what we have from excel print so the majority of this panel is, is our experts in kind of looking at how we integrate and how we uh, uh, make things work specifically on the hardware end. Uh, what, we're, what we do is we uh, have a novel concept for microtransfer printing capability that allows uh, complete integration of a lot of these things and, and really driving, driving cost uh, as we move forward. So a quick, quick summary for us, um, uh, Excel Print is, uh, a small startup company. Uh, we're based in Cork, Ireland, in uh, the Tunnel National Labs at the IPIC Center uh, there. Um, and then we have a wholly owned subsidiary in North Carolina uh, at the Micros building. Uh, and it's technology that came out of Professor John Rogers' lab, uh, and, and it's been uh, nurtured over the last 15 years. Honestly, for us, what we see is we see that very similar to what uh, was just said. Uh, that dig disaggregation of, of material and then reaggregation of that material into a specific panel or a specific pick in our case. So uh, what we have is we have the capability of taking a lot of different types of materials uh, and and uh, with a with an undercut layer, which we'll talk a little bit about very briefly later, um, you can actually lift and actually take the functional components of the devices. So. Uh, in this case, you could have uh, a mixture of in gas or indium phosphide and gas, um, GAN, whatever it may be, the best of the components that you can. Um, and what we can do is we can actually transfer print, in this case, lasers into place, uh, which really uh, dramatically reduces cost and, and increases performance, um, as well as photo detectors and, and modulators and other things of that nature. Um, and as we see, as, as we see it, we see a lot of this integration being uh, important in order to allow for better efficiency, uh, allow for better cost um, and, and better performance as we move forward. Uh, again, to a point that was made earlier with loss, uh, alignment's extremely important. So, you know, we've spent a lot of time as a company working with various customers, uh, putting this in place uh, under a micron alignment uh, accuracy in order to ensure that all of the components are, are lined up together. So, you know, how, how we do it, we actually use a, an elastomer stamp. Um, 
and what that elastomer stamp allows us to do is it allows us to uh, pick all these different materials um, and the materials can be in a very created in a very highly dense uh, area so as opposed to taking large pieces of material and moving it over or um, even taking uh, uh, just spare blocks uh, of base material and then producing it we can actually densely pack uh, very, very, very specific materials and very specific components together and then systematically pick them to a source uh, off of a source piece um, and then print them and integrate them into a into various things, uh, one of which we see as, as photonics being uh, an important piece of that. Uh, really, you know, starting with a high density wafer um, and then transferring as best we can. Uh, the, the transfer itself, uh, what we do is uh, we take it epitaxy, the epitaxy off of the wafer. And so the contacts are left uh, at the top and because they're very thin and we're talking, you know, lasers in between four and five microns, um, we can actually use, we, we call it a thin film mineral connect, but it's a traditional RDL method, uh, which allows contact to the material. Um, and then because we can pick an array of these, it's, it's got very high throughput for very, very thin uh, material as we move forward. Um, and then producing very, very good alignment. Um, again, passive alignment uh, really is is, uh, is is about a micron and a half, but really we, we've worked and had very good success at under half micron alignment with uh, active alignment as we move forward uh, with pattern recognition. So, you know, the, the better, the, the way that it works from our side is, you know, we start with a set of way, we set, we'll start with a uh, highly dense material. So in this case, these are LEDs. Uh, three by 10 microns uh, in size. Uh, they have an underlying uh, release layer. Uh, in this case, this was a silicon wafer. So we actually had, uh, we used the benefit of 100 silicon, but we also have lattice match material, gas and indium phosphide. Uh, and we dense to create the devices that can then be tested. Then after that, basically the they're undercut. Mm -hmm. So we do a, a uh, in, in the case of silicon TMAH and, and you know, in case of other materials, we have different uh, release chemistries that release the material from the handle wafer and basically create what we would consider a MEM source. Um, we custom create uh, elastomer stamps. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see that thin uh, LED sitting on a five micron post. Uh, but basically it works like a, we, we call it, it, it we, it's, uh, we call it like a, we liken it to a Band-Aid. So if you put a Band-Aid on your skin and you move it very quickly, the hair comes off of your skin. If you move it very slowly, um, it does not, so it's a viscoelastic um, uh, method that allows a quick pull for it to be printed or picked, and then um, it comes into contact with a destination wafer um, and then prints, um, and then again, uh, depending on the size of it, we can run these uh, metal lines on top in order to integrate everything as we move forward. We see a lot of, a lot of use in this, um, specifically in trying to cut cost uh, and improve, improve use of 3.5 material, uh, especially with lasers um, in general. Uh, we have had a lot of customers that have been interested in it within the silicon photonics platform um, and modulators and optical amplifiers. Uh, so we have a we have a very good uh, a set of uh, customers that we worked with as well as some vendors that are producing uh, print ready. And to the point that was made earlier, the ecosystem is extremely fragmented. I, I, wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, you know, our, our goal has been to uh, work with that um, and some companies are, are working on their own on that as well. Um, but, you know, this this method of disaggregation and reaggregation can be used for many things. Um, obviously, you know, uh, there's a, a GAN uh, can be used for um, high power uh, transistors. Um, so we have, uh, have proven out material uh, working with that integration to CMOS. Um, as well as looking at uh, disaggregating and reaggregating power components in order for them to have shorter um, connection paths uh, and reduce parasitics as you move forward. Um, and then again, only uh, looking at GAN RF as well, um, specifically trying to take the active portions of the material and really using it to the best of its ability as you move forward. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much what I have for my presentation. Thank you, David. You said that the uh, LEDs are sub ten microns in size. Yeah, so that those were those were uh, we did a, a, a 
a five, I'd say it was, we, we've done any, we've done components down to three micron by three micron. Those were a five by 10 micron size LED, um, but there are companies that are making them smaller as we move forward. And what's typical size, what's, what small size of a laser have you accomplished? We've done, so nominally what we've done is we've done anywhere from about a millimeter in length and about 80 microns in, in height or, or width, um, all the way out to, uh, there's been experimentation done at the University of Ghent all the way up to about two and a half mic, uh, millimeters um, in length. Uh, one of the benefits that we had, and we actually talked with a, a vendor at one point in time who was making lasers, I said, well, you know, we've got to keep them large because we've got to keep these bond pads in place. And we talked to him and said, well, what if we took the bond pads away and you just did direct connect to the, uh, the laser itself? Um, you can actually add more and increase the uh, density. So we've actually had really, really good success with that as we move forward. Can you disclose any, any use cases or applications of, uh, of, of a dense aggregated array of LEDs or lasers? Actually, for, for dense, dense LEDs, uh, we actually have a spinoff company, it's Display, and they're actually creating displays um, out of micro LEDs uh, using an active component. So they're actually using a, an IC to control uh, each LED pixel, and they're integrating uh, red, green, and blue uh, in order to drive displays. Uh, we've got a couple of other customers who are using it uh, within photonics regions, but those are... Uh, <laughs> Those are confidential at this point for us. Okay, thank you. Very good, uh, Benny. Do you see my slides? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about NVIDIA and about the networking uh, strategy and about, you know, uh, connectivity and optics. Uh, so just sort of uh, maybe some of the uh, uh, attendees are, uh, are familiar with NVIDIA. Um, NVIDIA is a platform company uh, operating in the data center and also in, uh, in, in graphics uh, generally. Uh, our focus now in, in this talk will be around uh, uh, what's happening in the data center in the AI space. Uh, so we see a, 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 a you know, huge speed up happening inside the data center. Um, we'll, if we look back on the traditional single, single third performance of uh, regular CPUs that carried, that happened, you know, in the uh, 70s and 80s, now we have the accelerated computing happening uh, with basically million, million X speed up happening, uh, both accelerated computing, they both on uh, scaling up and scaling out. And machine learning, machine learning pushing it uh, to, to the extreme. Uh, the AI technology is uh, being is being used for uh, uh, climate change research, for dig digital biology, and, 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 and finding you know uh, um, virus research for industrial HPC. Uh, for example, people trying to build digital twins for industrial infrastructure so they will be able to uh, predict the maintenance windows and have the infrastructure more, working more efficiently and also in the renew renewable energy space. So this is where AI is, AI is happening today. Uh, NVIDIA uh, builds is a platform company that does uh, the silicon components, the GPUs, the CPUs. This is a, is a, a new, a new, a new field. The gray CPUs, the blue field, which are smart NICs and switching infrastructure to connect uh, all of this together. 
NVIDIA does the system software and also build the full platforms uh, for HPC, for AI, and uh, Omniverse, which is the NVIDIA platform to serve the metaverse. And on top of that, there is a development of uh, full applications on top of those, on those platforms. Uh, more specifically, on the HPC AI and networking space. Uh, so supercomputing uh, is, is uh, the development of cloud native supercomputing using the uh, networking um, uh, infrastructure that is developed. So we, there is the quantum infinite switches, the Connectix and Bluefield NIX and SmartNIX and DPUs the spectrum internet switches and also gateways uh, to, to do long range connectivity for those uh, supercomputers. And importing building blocks of those supercomputers when you're using GPUs is the DGX, which is a pretty sophisticated computer that has uh, eight uh, GPUs and has networking connectivity to connect uh, to connect all those GPUs together, plus uh, to connect the GPUs externally to other GPUs. And we're gonna to touch on this and see the, the network requirement, optical requirement when connecting all those GPUs together. So here we have a, a sort of a block diagram of the DGX. You can see the eight GPUs. Uh, there is NVLink connectivity between all the GPUs internally, internally inside the box. And there is a, a networking connectivity uh, taking all these bandwidths outside of the box. Um, today, it's, it's, it's both infinite band and ethernet. And uh, the amount of bandwidth that it needs to go out of the box, that might be the good, uh, good topic to talk about uh, re-aggregation and, and disaggregation. Um, so if we try to sort of match the networking bandwidth that is going out of the box to the potential, to, to the overall memory bandwidth inside the box, you know, between the GPUs and the, and the memory uh, adjacent to those GPUs, we, do a, we, we see a 32x uh, throughput gap or bandwidth gap between the overall memory bandwidth available in GPUs versus what is available going through the network. Uh, and as AI models become bigger and bigger, uh, this workload uh, requires more bandwidth. Um, so one way to try to resolve, so with, with traditional optics, uh, pluggable, uh, if we try to uh, move all these bandwidth between the uh, GPUs with traditional pluggables, uh, you can see uh, the potential price increase in the system on the left and on the right is the power consumption uh, that will be required to do that. Um, this is where uh, uh, re-aggregation re and co optical co-packaging uh, uh, will, will come into play. And this is where we see a huge value in, in that. And uh, trying to look forward, uh, what are the requirements uh, moving forward? Th th this is a graph that shows the, the, uh, tra the training uh, compute, the petaflops that are needed to train models. You can look at the years and the trends. Basically, um, um, we have a 25.7x in two years on the transformer AI models. So the transformer uh, are growing uh, rapidly. And this all translates to um, network requirement and memory and bandwidth requirement. Co-packaging might be the way to actually achieve that. Thank you, Benny. Um, all right, finally, let's uh, let's go to Nick.
Hello, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. So I'm going to talk about this aggregation from kind of a different perspective from the other speakers. Um, I spend my time thinking about designing and architecting overall uh, systems for supercomputing. Um, and so I work at the Department of Energy uh, Office of Science Mission Computing Center, which is called NERSC. Um, and so our job essentially is to support science in the Department of Energy. Anybody that wants to do simulation or data analysis related to their science goals, they can get time and storage uh, at NERSC to do that with. Um, what that means is we have a really large user base across many different institutions, universities, government labs, and things like that. So it's a um, this just gives you a rough idea of the breadth of things that we we uh, have running on our machines. Um, you can see that uh, this is a breakdown of, of how the time on the machine is allocated during the year 2018. So it has a very uh, um, distribution with a very long tail. So even though 10 codes make up half of the workload um, and 20 codes make up 66%, um, there is a really long tail there, right? The, the final 15 or 16 percent is uh, over 600 codes. So we have a broad range of users uh, and applications that we we are trying to design machines in order to meet the needs of. So I don't really need to know, go through this uh, too much with this audience. Everybody, I think, knows what this aggregation is. I just wanted to put this here just to make a couple of points. So. Um, you know, everybody knows, you know, you have an on-node resource and you can move it across the fabric and disaggregate it and have it off-node. Um, of course, that doesn't make any sense if you have the same amount of that resource. It's probably actually going to cost you more and going to inhibit your performance. So the only reason you would want to do it is if you could actually reduce the amount of that resource and then share it in some way between the nodes. So if um, each of the nodes was only using it half the time, for example, that might be a net win. So one of the things we've been thinking about is which resources does it make sense to move across the network and do this with? And then secondly, what are the performance implications? Um, so as I just alluded to, the first question you need to ask yourself if you're gonna do this kind of thought experiment is, is there sufficient asymmetry of usage across applications that are running on your machine in order to make have the disaggregation make sense? If everybody wants to use this resource all of the time, then just leave it on the node. There's no point in moving it across the network. That doesn't add any value. Um, the second question we need to think about, and because it takes us several years to procure and uh, configure a supercomputer, is to pay attention to some of the things that are up and coming, which is why it's uh, nice to attend a meeting like Hot Interconnect to see what they are so that we can see how we might be able to do it in the future, even though in the past it may not necessarily have made sense to do. So I just want to think quickly about three different categories of technology uh, that you might want to think about disaggregating. Um, and we'll start with uh, just non-volatile storage, hard disks, or SSDs. Um, some of you probably know in the supercomputing world, we've had massive parallel file systems for uh, 20 years at this point. Um, and the main reason why was because the technology was available uh, in that time frame, and there was a large asymmetry of usage. So if you imagine that pie chart I had a second ago where we had an asymmetric distribution of people using computer time, there's a similar asymmetric distribution of people using storage volume and or storage bandwidth. So it really makes sense to uh, disaggregate that, and I don't think we're necessarily going to go back, uh, although... Um, as with all these kind of uh, things, as soon as you aggregate, it does come with somewhat of a penalty if many of the users are trying to use it all at the same time. So it isn't perfect, but certainly on average, it, it is the thing to do. So then the next question we're starting to think about is would we do disaggregation for memory? Um, and so the first question then we need to ask ourselves is how much memory are people using today on our machines? And so this is a pretty typical plot you'll see if you talk to people across supercomputing centers across the world, or maybe even um, some instances in cloud uh, service providers. On average, 90% um, of the uh, cycles on the machine are using um, you know, 60% of the memory and 75% 
of the cycles are using 45% of the memory. So we could, in principle, um, throw away half the dims already on a machine. If it wasn't for the fact it would reduce the bandwidth, um, we could certainly throw them away from a capacity uh, sense. Um, or we could think about uh, disaggregating them, that memory across the network. Um, and so this is kind of a cartoon way of thinking about uh, the performance implications of doing that and whether it's a good idea or not. So along the x-axis is just the, the memory usage. And the y-axis is the percentage of memory references off nodes. So obviously, those of you who have thought about this deeply will realize it's a little more, more complicated than this, but uh, this is a good place to start to think about. So uh, if you take the DDR memory off node and you keep your high bandwidth memory on node, like you might think about doing, especially on future architectures, it's kind of obvious that if your memory usage is less than your high bandwidth memory capacity, then you're going to be fine, right? Uh, and for, if we look out into the sort of uh, HBM3 era, looking at some of the kind of numbers I had on the previous slide, um, it looks like, you know, like I said, for roughly uh, a significant fraction of our workload, that might be an okay thing to do. Um, but then there's gonna be some people or some users that do wanna use uh, a lot more memory than there is on the node. Um, and depending upon uh, the fraction of memory references that go on the node to off the node, they're either gonna be happy, i.e. towards the top right of this figure, or they're gonna be unhappy and get a substantial performance hit towards the bottom right of this figure. So in a paper we just submitted, we actually analyzed 10 different applications that um, are in uh, our workload. We actually found that uh, 10 of the 11 were above this dashed line. So it does look quite promising in terms of uh, disaggregating memory for our uh, workload. Clearly, we've got a little more analysis to do. But the preliminary signs are, uh, are, are quite good. Um, so the second category of things that you could think about disaggregating and putting across the network um, is uh, a generic accelerator. So you could think about an FPGA or a GPU or uh, an AI accelerator more generally. Um, this one, unfortunately, at this point, we don't actually have any usage data to answer how easy, how much there is asymmetry in the usage of these. So um, this is not as rich of a figure. At the same time, you can still imagine a very simply minded kind of analysis. You know, the uh, cheaper it is to move the data across to the accelerator, which is what is plotted on the x-axis here. And the faster the accelerator is, which is what is plotted on the y-axis, the more likely you are to want to be able to move the data or move the work across the network to that accelerator. So one of my hopes is that uh, the optical interconnects coming in the future will extend the uh, range of this x-axis, um, give us more and more bandwidth uh, out to these kind of accelerators, which might uh, make the value proposition much more um, greater than it does today. So uh, just to sum that up, like I said, I think in the future for, for looking at DDR memory and moving that off node and maybe just leaving HBM memory on node, it looks like probably in the, in the CXL uh, second generation, we're probably gonna be able to do that, certainly on our supercomputing machines. Um, for other accelerators, I think it's fair to say the jury is, is still out uh, and we're working hard to try and understand if that will work for us or not. Um, one thing I did want to mention was uh, quantum computing accelerators. I think even without any analysis, it's reasonably clear that there's going to be a large asymmetry in usage of those for the users on us supercomputing systems, which, and given their nature, it almost certainly implies that first devices will be deployed this way, but you aren't going to want to connect a, a quantum accelerator with CXL across a network. That's a very different discussion. So just to sum up, um, disaggregation really does uh, open up a really large design space of solutions. Um, but just because you can doesn't mean that you should, right? Uh, the design space is really huge um, and you really, really need to know what your workload needs in order to be able to navigate it. Um, so one of the things we're thinking about is how we um, evaluate what our workload needs looking out to the future, given that we have this large number of applications and um, 
breadth of different use cases. Um, so certainly we want some flexibility in our uh, solution that we end up with, but you know, the reason that our users run on our machines is because they're fast, right? They want performance. And so there's definitely a trade-off there between flexibility and performance. And in the future, it's definitely true that we don't want to build the most flexible architecture because it almost certainly will not be the most performant one. So that's all I had to say. Um, this is the view from Berkeley Lab out over to the city of San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge is just behind the building there. So if you ever come a, ever in Berkeley and want to drop by and have a, a look, you'll very be, be very welcome. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you <clears throat> very much, uh, Nick. It, it's a beautiful spot. It's, it's, it's a bit of a trek from Berk, the downtown Berkeley BART station if you're walking up. Um, that's where so, you get the bus right exactly so the bus the bus can be very very, very helpful in that regard the views can be great that was the bay bridge that you were seeing there on the left side of that photo so thank you um boy there was a lot to, to feed on there um i'm going to ask a question and uh while we're talking about that i'd, I'd like the panelists to think of questions to ask ask each other a couple of themes that came through a number of the presentations is uh, factors uh influencing this, which include power consumption, cost, and shoreline. And <clears throat> actually, I heard a very interesting comment from a couple of the slides. Uh, or it was Serial, and I, I think um, one was after that, um, of uh, gigabits per second, not only per millimeter, but per square millimeter or per cubic millimeter. So I'd love to hear from, from you folks about when really when two and three dimensional shoreline is is a factor what kind of use cases drive optimizing that one throw that open to anyone surreal you you put it on there first so if you'd like to first but i'd like the other people to to, to weigh in sure um so i mean i think as a, as a general uh, metric it doesn't necessarily imply that the shoreline itself is two dimensional or or three dimensional is more a statement of you know how small can you make the overall um you know overall solution um in, in this case <clears throat> you know an optical uh, transceiver how, you know what kind of physical space does it does it take up um you know one dimensional shoreline at least in terms of a, of a face plate um you know the 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 width um, of the rack is is a typical uh, is a typical constraint, um, but with the move from uh, faceplate pluggables to to co packaging, we did actually get uh, at least two dimensional uh, shoreline because now you're going to arrange these optical engines uh, around a you know, um, a substrate that is you know typically square. Um, with the, the the bare switch ASIC in the middle and the uh, optical engines uh, arranged around the perimeter uh, of that substrate, so that that, that has been um, you know an important change from um, you know going from faceplate pluggables to to co packaging, uh, so that now you can use all four edges of that substrate. But obviously, that's going to be a, a much smaller. Um, you know, even, even if you use all the sides there, it's going to be much smaller than the space that you had at your disposal uh, at the faceplate. So that, you know, clearly drives a requirement for um, the overall uh, bandwidth uh, density that you need to, to hit to uh, enable that um, change. Other responses? With... Uh, I, I, I can say that the, definitely uh, the beachfront of the ICs and the combination of the number of fibers that has to go into to be co packaged with this IC is a challenge. Uh, and as Cyril talked about ecosystem alignment and, uh, and leveraging. Uh, economy of scale here. Uh, so we, we gave a talk in OFC uh, trying to align the industry toward a direction that we think makes sense in order to, you know, to work here together. Um, I don't understand, I don't remember exact details on that, but the, the combination of uh, 
the challenge to have so many fibers uh, going into a single AC requires some innovation and alignment of the industry. I mean that, that that's exactly right. The the um, management of all these fibers inside the box and taking them from the faceplate, where now you have passive optical connectors, um, to a much uh, smaller CPO assembly somewhere uh, in in the inside that box is is a huge challenge. And for that reason, uh, I think that solutions that exploit the wavelength dimension by multiplexing multiple wavelengths onto a single fiber um, has been preferred in this space so far to uh, especially to to mitigate this fiber management uh, issue because uh, the you know the fiber pitch uh, can only be reduced so far before you have to uh, you know start using specialty uh, fibers and then you know your your cost advantage goes right out the window so that's that's one uh, a very important concern. So um, I know that uh, David talked about his micro transfer printing to create um, all these different <clears throat> uh, materials on single substrate, very small size, and you can ag aggregate them. But um, I mean that raises sort of two questions in my in my mind. Uh, does that enable sort of three D fabrication of circuits and IO, the connectors to go with this? And is there, what is the state of the art in, in these mic, in micro optic connectors to take advantage of that small size? I mean, at least from what we see, we have, uh, we've seen the ability to try to, to integrate the different materials into a standard pick wafer. And that pick wafer uh, you know, we, the modulation of size as well as efficient use of uh, the 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 three five material is allowed for a really good cost advantage. Um, I think I think to your point, as you move, you know, and, and points that have been made as you move forward, um, you know, you can go to a certain size, um, and and then you can you have to look at a, a specialty fiber uh, that can be used. There are certain customers that are using that, and and sort of our AI looks at applications where they're trying to do. Uh, a dense array of pixels or a dense array of, of, of other materials in order to transmit <coughs> signals across. But uh, I, I think uh, I, I think you know very very much that uh, the, the the industry is fa fragmented and there's no really there's not really a good set of standards. Um, so the more that that uh, you know the bigger companies like Nvidia and, and others can push uh, that standard. Um, the more we can all kind of get into those pieces, because you know one of the one of the one of the biggest points that we have and and we know we have challenge with is uh, integration into a standard PDK, so that a customer can get a standard PDK set out of a standard boundary, so that it's not a one source; it is a a technology driver. Um, so and we that's kind of what we've seen as we move forward. Um, to hear what everybody else has uh, observed. So, so as this evolves, as this technology for, for the optical decks evolves, uh, Michael, how does that affect the, uh, the design of your switch? I know your innovation is in the, in the steering of these uh, piezoelectric um, transceivers, but you've got to have connectors, you know, in at least two other places. Um, how, do, how does that, how does that evolve? Uh, well, I mean, it, it is a challenge. Face plates on our switches are, are, are getting larger. If, if people want low loss, then the old fashioned MCP, the, the, the old fashioned LC connectors, for example, still provide the best performance in our case. Um, and, 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 and MPO connectors, Give us a bit more uh, face space place uh, face plate density, um, but then of course you take a, a hit on loss. So um, I mean we have in the past actually as part of uh, uh, another uh, European project 
modified one of our switches to, to handle multi-core fiber but that's only very limited as well because you in our case we'd have to lim we, we have to switch all cores at once so um so so yeah i mean it's a challenge like you say um and um we look to see where really where where, where high density connectors are going I've, I've seen that mpo higher density mpo connectors are coming but that's only a, that's only going to scratch the surface yeah, you know, there's a there's a, a scale tension going on here. I know Benny mentioned, Nick mentioned it, um, and, and and Michael, you when when we've got uh, accelerated computing needs, and, and and Andrew Lord mentioned this morning accelerated you know bandwidth. That doesn't mean we have we can scale you know the the connectors or or, or the links at, at the same same rate. Um, and so we're actually, I think, struggling to keep up on the interconnect side with what's going on inside these, you know, increasingly interesting and disaggregated and pooled uh, computing engines. So, so, so Nick, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, how can we perhaps even reduce, you know, live with this, you know, scale imbalance or, or reduce the, the stress on the, the physical components that are really hard to to make so small and so prevalent uh, to avoid their having to keep up quite so much with what goes on inside the all the XPUs. Well, I think the the key is probably thinking about the topology and the tapering of the network, right? Instead of trying to have full bisection for everything to talk. To everything at the same bandwidth, you're probably going to see um, deeper, richer hierarchies of, of uh, bandwidths and latencies, and that's probably the easiest way to do it, right? Um, and that's one of the other things we're thinking about. So the other thing I didn't really touch on is if you disaggregate and you say, okay, I've got this resource that's over here. Well, do you have, uh, you know, one of them in every rack, one of them in every five nodes, or one giant pool that covers your whole data center, right? There's an element of uh, exactly where you put it, how far do you put it away uh, from the compute resource. And that kind of design space can help with the kind of question you're getting. It won't completely address it, but it can help. Other thoughts from all the others on that question? Uh, can I just can I just add actually that um, we found very similar aspects in the in the Dreadbox project. For example, we found that the, the optical switch fabric didn't need to have full radix, um, especially if you have uh, local switching um, integrated within transceivers, such as I demonstrated. I showed there there was a, a a sort of network on a chip at the, each end of the the uh, connect the optical connection, and that meant you. Your optical fabric could be um, built up in planes, which weren't necessarily connected to each other. And, and then, in actual fact, that allows higher density as well, higher density of optical switching. Um, so that was a, a, one of the findings we came out of there. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, I got one question externally. Um, make this the last question, then I'll go around and give everyone a chance to make one final statement. Uh, how do we test all of these things in sequences that are cost effective and do not mean that we have to throw out? chips that are already integrated. I think it's part of the ecosystem question, but it's it's also uh, more than that. I mean, it, this is a really, really good one. And um, this has been one of the driving factors to make sure that, you know, when you have an assembly that has a very expensive switch chasing and a bunch of uh, you know, also expensive optical engines around it, around it there's some degree of reworkability. Um, so the tendency has been to try and you know not solder everything down, but have some kind of socket interface there still. Of course, it needs to be very, um, uh, very low loss and, and low reflections and all, all that goodness to make sure that you don't impair the channel un unnecessarily. But from the uh, perspective of building systems that have any kind of reasonable yield, uh, that is an extremely uh, big concern. 
Um, so what one aspect is assembling the optical engines to that substrate, and the other one is the point that Benny already brought up um, of um, you know how do you attach all the fibers uh, inside the box to the to the face plate. I think th those two are probably the um, uh, the key concerns with respect to overall uh, yeah, overall yield that you have to address to be able to to build these things um, in a um, in an economically viable way. Yeah. Other thoughts? I agree. Taking co packaging to the manufacturing challenge, being smart on how you yield things and what's the flow of assembly thing, it's one of the big challenges here. And uh, so, might be the competitive edge of some of the vendors. Yeah, well, David, I know you're going to sell weapons to, uh, to all sides. Yeah, I mean, we've we again we've seen we've seen that as a as an as a key factor. So it's just a matter of trying to find and 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 trying to minimize use um, again with with potentially lower power using our amplifiers in order to increase lifetime um, of of some of the components, especially the lasers as we move forward, um, and then just trying to uh, test as best you can. Uh, before everything's integrated and bring systems in and then obviously the the fun of trying to predetermine when things will fail so that you have an optical switch or a switch over that can be done before it fails or as it's failing have a replacement as you move forward so okay uh it's quarter past the hour final final thought final statement nick we'll start with you um i think that uh it is clearly going to be a really interesting time in the future with lots of challenges to try and figure out what the optimal design point or points are. Um, and one of the things I personally hope is I don't have to get down to the micro LED level to think about how I'm going to build a machine. Um, but uh, that being said, I think uh, that definitely has is going to have to be um, some kind of questions essentially around how many different solutions does one need to cover the whole space of all of your customers, uh, potential customers, right? Or can you build things uh, flexibly? And that's the part that's really unclear to me is there a one size fits all solution here or uh, will uh, there'll be, I don't know, 10 SKUs or something like that. Yeah, right. That's open, open question. Michael, final thought. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I've been hearing that in the longer term uh, about the rise of ultra wideband um, transceivers, and um, it's interesting that um, maybe that will uh, address some of the issues we're thinking about here. Um, just on that note, actually, um, we are we at Huber Suna, we, we're not only just um, you, uh, developing our own our existing technology, uh, switching technology, but we've also um, just been a, a no notified that um, uh, another European project which will look at um, sort of fast wave band selective switching technology um, has been approved. We're a member of this of this project, so um, so we're looking at these technologies. Um, I can't say anything more about it at this stage, but, but watch this space. Good, thank you, Benny. So, so uh, Nvidia is is working on enabling the industry for the co packaging efforts. Uh, um, we engage a lot of the industry partners to do that. And if someone here feels uh, that we might, might miss him, we will have to engage in that. So that's definitely something we do to, to enable the ecosystem. Very good, thank you. David? Uh, to, you know, to the points that have been made, I mean, Excel is trying to work on the ecosystem and at least for our solution, um, looking at trying to find uh, vendors that can create these components that allow a, a quick turn and a quick start um, and a quick run. So for us, it's about trying to get to a, a point where there's some standardization so that we can move forward together. Um, but we have seen, at least with the a lot of the key customers that we're working with, a, a kind of a, a band or, or a start towards a standardization uh, to a, a pick component. Um, so I think it's a lot of, of things to do as you move forward um, to the point that was made earlier of, <laughs> of, of worrying about the uh, by, by Nick about worrying about all of the different uh, 
micro LEDs one at a time. Um, I, I, I hope I don't have to worry about the architecture <laughs> at the same time. So I think uh, there's, there's a lot of good ways that hopefully we can present uh, or, or solutions can be presented, um, whether it's our technology or other technologies, but solutions that can be presented in order to allow building blocks to be integrated. Um, and then you know the, the the folks that have the ability to do more of the design and architecture can then take those blocks and and, and create a product pretty easily. Yeah, I agree. Uh, finally, serial. So I mean, look, looking back now on the the efforts related to to co packaging, I, I think that you know you could say that it's at this stage. A somewhat of a solution looking for a problem um, you know the the reception by the the end users who um, you know, should benefit from from this kind of technology has been somewhat uh, lukewarm um, so maybe more than a um, a final thought is perhaps a question to 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 Benny and uh, and, and Nick um, as to whether they see some sort of uh, inflection point in the near future where you know this technology um, really becomes necessary to to scale uh, you know the kinds of systems that that they are building um, so that there's there's some real traction uh, coming from from the HPC. Um, and an AI space to to really drive this forward and provide the impetus that so far has been missing. Yeah, so so definitely we're investing in this front. Uh, I can say that. I mean, I, I think you know my favorite quote, which is not exactly in this space, but it's very closely related, which is, you know, silicon photonics is the fusion energy of HPC, right? It will always be here tomorrow. And there's an element of that kind of stuff here too, right? If someone develops some optical thing that's better, you know, the copper guys keep push theirs a little further and so on and so on, right? And so it's true, eventually they're gonna um, run out of runway, but when that will be, I don't know. If you want to privately message me there and tell me which stocks to buy in order to predict that, that would be awesome. <laughs> all right, we'll leave it at that. It's a late for, for very late for three of you. Thank you so much, all all the panelists, for a most enlightening discussion and presentation. And uh, I hope you can get copies of the slides because I want to study them uh, at greater length myself. So that concludes the panel discussion. Thanks to all of you who attended, and certainly for those of you uh, five who presented on the panel. Uh, stay tuned for the. Head Bubba Memorial Cocktail Reception, which is still not an in-person cocktail reception, but we do have the, the trivia game and I'll hand it back over to uh, Manju. Oh, thanks, Dan. Yeah, this uh, concludes the panel and also the technical content. Oh, let me switch on my video. I'm still here. <laughs> so uh, we'll conclude the technical content and then uh, we'll head over to the trivia is going to be fun uh trivia the first thing wins fifty dollars so you all want to join me thanks we'll see you there the link okay. uh, for right. the trivia is uh in the chat and also put it on the put it on the slack so please join and we'll see you for the technical content tomorrow at 9 a.m pt thanks stay tuned for that and tomorrow night the conference resumes thank you all again thank you